Because if we don't invest in the environment, we are going to be in a very, very bad place. We heard about the ICU case. Now let's try and see if you can find health solutions to this ICU case. So, um, uh, my friend, I think if your panelists, uh, panelists are ready, um, I think maybe we, uh, you know, get underway. So, health matters. Thank you very much, uh, Larry Asego, for that uh, very wonderful introduction. And of course, it's an honor uh, to be here with uh, the rest of uh, the audience and all the sector players in as far as championing the need to find solutions to the challenges of uh, climate change for Africa are concerned. I would like to introduce uh, my guests yet again. I know Larry Asego has done a good job there, but again, I would love to emphasize that uh, we have on my immediate left, Dr. Elisha Osati, MD, internal medicine specialist, cardiology, cardiorespiratory physician at Mohimbili National Hospital in Tanzania. A very warm welcome, and we are, of course, honored by your presence here. On my extreme left is uh, Dr. Andrew Kambugu, is executive director, Sandy McConnell, Infectious Disease Institute, that is under Macquarie University in uh, Uganda. Many thanks for joining us. And of course, uh, we shall get underway right away by giving you a bit of a preamble on exactly what the discussion is uh, going to be. Africa faces up to rising climate-related health emergencies. Uh, climate change is already having adverse effects on human health in Africa in many ways. It's worsening malnutrition and is estimated uh, to account for more than half of 12,000 to 19,000 heat-related child deaths in Africa that is in between the years 2011 and 2022. It's a grim statistic and people should actually pay attention to that. Projections the see increased poor air quality, a polluted drinking water and the expansion of a range of infectious disease pathogens and vectors. For those of us that will need to understand a little bit more about pathogens and uh, vectors and how they behave, of course, uh, later on, the experts will be helping us on that. The question is, can the worst be averted? And if so, what are the indigenous interventions that are holding up hope? I'll begin with Dr. Andrew Kambugu. Health-related uh, climate uh, change health related emergencies in the country or in the continent rather we are already facing problems in health and before climate change became an issue there were really really very many and the impact was widespread now that we have a new context within us how best are we supposed to come to terms with that thank you very much chris and uh, uh, greetings from kampala to our audience uh, let me start by applauding uh, the Nation Media Group and their leadership for this opportunity, which is really around African leadership. As somebody who comes from a science and medical background, you're used to Africa getting received wisdom. And there are those of us, including myself and the institute uh, that I lead, that are really trying to change the narrative where leadership should come from Africa. And I've been very encouraged by uh, the sessions this morning. I also thought I should sneak in a kind of a personal uh, story that really um, really highlights the influence of the national, uh, Nation Media Group. Uh, in the mid 80s as a young primary school going kid, I remember picking up the Daily Nation after my dad had gone through it yeah. and really being keen to read this. And, and this carried on and was very delighted with the development of the East African newspaper, looking at the quality of the reportage and commentary and analysis. And actually, that's how I got to learn about the uh, Kusi Ideas Festival, which really struck a chord in terms of really changing the African narrative. And I also want to applaud the focus on climate uh, change. Yeah. Uh, someone like me who is in clinics and in programs and seeing really the tail end of climate change. Um, I'm very encouraged. There's a, a, a saying by a poet that for every 1,000 people hacking at the leaves, there's only one at the, the at the roots. Yeah. And I feel a meeting like this is really focusing the energy. And a, a practitioner like me is very keen to, to join that. I also wanted to mention, again, in the spirit of the importance of in institutions coming from Makere, which celebrated 100 years uh, this year, that at the Infectious Diseases Institute at the university where I come from, we are really trying to tap into the youth bulge of Africa, to tap into African talent 
to take leadership across different things. I think one crisp example I want to cite, because you talked about solutions, is the role of data science. And being based at a university, we are bringing together multidisciplinary groups in health, in geography, mathematics, so that we use data to address the health challenges, including climate change. One example is a group that is looking at air quality in Kampala using the Center of Excellence in Data Science at the Institute. So these are examples of African-grown solutions at African institutions by African scientists. And when I have the chance, I would, I would want to elaborate on some of the things that we're doing. Of course, we will be elaborating a little bit later. Uh, Dr. Elisha Osati from uh, the Bohembili uh, Hospital, what is your view on exactly what the climate uh, change-related health emergencies are? Can we have a vivid picture of what they are so that the person out there, especially those in the rural areas of our continent, can understand the connection between the two? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chris, and uh, also joining my, my colleague to thank the National Media Group, first for inviting us to this uh, important event, and actually as we are discussing the climate change. So for us, as I said, we are, we are sitting in the clinics, and, and we are seeing the effect direct to the patients, what we are seeing. So I'm working as a respiratory and cardiovascular uh, physician at back at, at Moimbili, but also uh, teaching uh, the student within the, the Department of Internal Medicine in the university. And actually, you're going around and, and, and see how the, the climate change have brought a lot of uh, um, impacts in, in the community. So we can just take, for example, we, we have had yeah, a, a presentation talking about the air pollution, for example. So talk about the air pollution, it means you're talking about lungs. Yes, so our lungs are receiving more than nine, more than ninety percent of us receive very bad uh, uh, um, air that we breathe in that aff actually affect our lungs. And um, you know, we can just take example of uh, of uh, I, I'll just give example of COVID when the COVID came in, and we are we are doing a study back in Tanzania where uh, I'm leading the the group. Uh, and we are trying to follow up the 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 sequel or the complications of patients who had severe COVID. And actually, you have found almost 80% of our patients who had uh, uh, chronic uh, pulmonary obstructive lung diseases have died. More than 80% of them has died, actually. Those were we admitted. Those we, we admitted now is when we discharged them. So when you are following up on them, and you found more than 80% of them has died. And that is because their lungs cannot fight, cannot hold more oxygen, because it's been affected with, with, uh, with different factors, including the, the polluted air. And you know, uh, there are a lot of particles uh, around. For example, if you go to the, to the towns, the cars and the industries will produce uh, bad air, and that contain particles that itself will go to the lungs and affect uh, the lungs. So th those are really the examples that, that, that we are seeing. And uh, if you take about, for example, the, the again, the obstetric lung disease again, and the contribution of, of, uh, of uh, our, our parents who are using the, the firewood, for example, from the villages. And the, the effect is, is massive uh, if you want to, to follow that up. So the, the climate change has brought a lot of uh, effect direct to our patients. But again, leave aside uh, from in infectious diseases to, yeah. to non-communicable diseases. You will talk about malnutrition, for example. So if we get a time more, we will elaborate uh, much on that. But yeah. just in that introduction, thank you. Yeah, in fact, I was due to uh, pose it to you, uh, the fact that uh, many of the uh, events that happen as a result of climate change do condition the kind of uh, malnutrition that you're talking about. When, for example, uh, drought happens in a community and then that drought conditions a famine and then people are unable to get to the, to be able to feed as uh, sufficiently or even as effectively on a, a diet. Within the African context, uh, paint us a picture of how the state of affairs is because we already had malnutrition in many areas across the continent. Now that these incidents are increasing, how is the correlation? 
can somebody directly say the increase is to a certain per to a particular percentage as a result of climate change to a condition or a scenario that has happened before even before climate change happened can yeah please uh, yeah, l let me look at this through the lens um, of infectious diseases then my colleague will talk about uh, yes. some of the sure. other so I wanted to say that there are some factors that are converging mm -hmm. and then climate change is really coming in to accelerate it. Uh -huh. So let me highlight three things that uh, I'm sure will interest our audience. One is the rapid explosion of populations in Africa. In the country I come from Uganda, I think we have one of the highest fertility rates. Each woman is estimated to have up to seven children on average. So this puts pressure on the environment and yeah. it you know populations end up invading habitats where humanity has not even been and this is a risk for infectious diseases so that's one driver the second driver really is connectivity the world is so interconnected compared to before um, if you go to the internet you can actually look at density maps for flight plans you'll be amazed at how much air traffic there is and uh, COVID-19 just tells the story. A virus is discovered in Wuhan, and before you know it, it's on every continent. Uh, so the third thing I want to highlight um, is we are really blessed in Africa uh, with what we call eco-diversity. I mean, we are here in Kenya, the Rift Valley. But what it really means is that they are pathogens, they are viruses that humans have not encountered before. And as this population increases and as we are interconnected, we can encounter a germ that can really become an existential threat. So when you look at those three factors, climate change just comes in to accelerate the prospect of an, an outbreak. So I'm speaking to you coming from Uganda where we've just uh, trying to get on top of an Ebola outbreak. And if you look at the data of outbreaks in East and Central Africa, uh, you can do this as an exercise later today, you will see a steady rise in the frequency of outbreaks, infectious disease outbreaks. So it really means it's not a matter of if, it's when. And therefore, what are we doing? How are we building resilient health systems to meet this challenge? So at the institute that I had, for example, we've been supporting the Ministry of Health to establish a central, meaning in Kampala, but also a regional uh, entities called emergency operation centers. This is a unit where it's manned by well-trained people who are monitoring to detect and surveil so that we can uh, act quickly. And I can tell you that even the current outbreak, we're probably where we are because of some investment in systems, including the contribution of the university. Thank okay. you. Oh, thank you very much. I would go to Dr. Elisha Osati, to whom I had uh, wanted to tackle the aspect of uh, malnutrition before the adverse effects of climate change were registered to the effectiveness with which they are being registered right now. We already had aspects and uh, incidents of uh, malnutrition in the Horn of Africa, uh, within East African region. We are seeing uh, the cases of the same within Northern Kenya. I do not know whether the interventions that were rolled out before the specter of climate change have been improved to cater for the new incidents that are happening. Uh, thank you so much. I think uh, uh, the malnutrition that that we already have, and uh, now come the, the climate change, which also have impact on 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 the mal on the nutrition or nutrition status or, or the, the our ways of life. So so you find you give the example for example uh, of of areas that had that have uh, uh, severe malnutrition currently. And uh, last 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 two months, I was I went to to a field in the pastoralist areas. And actually, we are shown here on, on, on the screen, the the liver, the, the cows died. So so when you are in, in, in the villages, you know, for example, if you go to pastoralists, they have a lot of, of, of cows around. And, you know, they they depend on on cows for, for food, for, for everything. And, you know, we, we've, 
in the village we found um, one these people will move away with, 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 with their with their cows but again those who cannot move they will remain in the village and actually they will die and you know that that will cause the root of malnutrition of these people because uh, the cows are their ways of life they cannot get milk anymore and the, because they're not not used to to, to cultivate uh, uh, other other crops so so th that's that's had added uh, where we are with, with the malnutrition and actually the, the drought that has affected the, the part for example in East Africa is you no know, we are not growing cr crops are not growing much and and thus bring bring a lot of uh, uh, of famine in the in the country in the region and and the malnutrition comes in but again you 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 we had examples of uh, leave aside the, the 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 droughts but also uh, the floods we had stories of, of floods elsewhere in 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 the world and when the flood come it means they will destroy the, the the crops around and and then again that will add against to the to malnutrition that we have so we 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 really we really think that the, the, there must be solu solutions. If you go through the, for example, the, the last uh, COP27 and, and the COP26, with a discussion on, on, on uh, climate change and health, you'll find the solutions that we, we, we also um, encourage. So the you know, WHO talk about uh, six building blocks of health system, but again, we can add more. And, and we really need to have the resilient uh, uh, health system that, that can fight uh, these impacts that, that are here. So if you allow me to proceed. Please do. And, and, and you know, the, the first thing that, that you're talking about, we talk about the leadership and governance. So we need the commitment in the leadership and government. We, we had here this morning, the, the officials were here, but again, the private sector to lead and, and, and uh, so that we make sure that we have a good leadership and governance to have the commitment uh, to tackle the climate change. And the second thing with that is, uh, is the financial. So the, the financing to the uh, climate and, and health in, in that area. So we need to invest in that area and we need to, to, to do research, uh, climate research uh, um, um, area and you know, we know the, the, the real impact and we know who are the, who are vulnerables and and what are the capacity that we have but again we you also need to to invest in in uh, human resources for health uh because these are the people who will will help us build the the the, the system well we need to train them and they, they need to know how to adapt how to, to help people for example deal with malnutrition and deal with infectious disease you know wh when when it comes but again we should also be able to monitor to monitor the, the the warning signs so when the the the, the climate change is coming it, it be drought it be floods so we need to monitor we need to have ability to monitor the warning signs that for example the flood is here and and we know that in a few days probably you might end in cholera or, or spread of malaria or mizika or dengue dengue fever so the the uh, healthcare workers including the community health care workers. We should invest in them, and they know and teach um, uh, community how to deal with that. So, um, but also, again, we need infrastructure that can help us to, to handle that, because if you don't have uh, uh, good infrastructure that can handle our people, that we can use to, to treat people, is also one thing. But again, uh, it's talked about the data science. We cannot leave it aside, uh, including the, the technologies that, that we have and, and more research in that area. So. I think we, we, all these things that we are talking about, we, we really need to, to invest in them and they will depend on the leadership and governance that, that have commitment to put the finances and to make sure that whatever we have, uh, we use it to, to build uh, our healthcare system and make it strong. So maybe I can add there. Uh, Dr. Kambugu, you seem to have a supplement yeah. to Dr. Elisha's uh, submission. Yes, thank you. Chris, I wanted to build on my colleague's submission about um, a mindset change that we are witnessing, especially within the university. You know, universities are famous for building silos. Yeah. But there is a philosophy of One Health that is emerging. Uh, so traditionally, doctors train alone, veterinary surgeons, uh, water and environmental scientists. But at the university particularly, we are realizing that these are man-made divisions and pathogens, so if you take COVID-19, which jumped probably from an animal source 
and enter the human population. They don't respect the boundaries we've created, including professional boundaries. So we are beginning to uh, establish programs that are cross-disciplinary so that even as the students train, they really appreciate. So a medical in, uh, student appreciates the whole animal health perspective. Uh, an environmental health student appreciates what it is to have a human pathogen so that as they grow in their professions, they are more collaborative, understanding that a solution will have to be a multidisciplinary solution. So this is one crisp area where the approach has had to change. Okay. Thank you. Uh, keeping it with the solutions uh, to the problems and the effects that are caused by climate change, the communities that are worst affected uh, sometimes find themselves far-flung areas away from the public health infrastructure that is necessary uh, for them to be able to reach on time. I do not know whether the communication uh, campaigns that are rolled out, especially by governments, to help them understand, it's part of mindset change, but help them understand that the incidence, for example, of malaria in the last five years has increased as a result of climate change. Do they understand that? Because if they don't, reaction to the interventions that are rolled out could be, you know, a little bit negative, which could affect the ability of governments to be able to tackle this particular situation. I would like uh, Dr. Elisha Osati, in the case of Tanzania, how has this been rolled out? How do the authorities effectively communicate to the rural communities, more especially those that are affected, in order for them to accept and be compliant? in rolling out these interventions? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. I think that's a very important question. And, and I think that uh, this is where the, the, we need to take the, everybody need to be uh, on board. Because wh when you talk about, uh, we talk about advocacy now, advocacy of the, of, of the, the research findings or the, the government policies uh, to, to people. And, and this, this uh, as we need, we need, for example, the gov now they when you come to Tanzania, we within the ministries, uh, we there is advocacy advo and health promotion and, and team that really um, will will make the the posters and and do um, program within the in the in the uh, media, television and and radios. But again, use of, of social media because you know this time we have a, we have. A, 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 a platform that almost everybody in the country, every almost every family, uh, can get access to to information through social media. So they are getting um, a use of social media and mainstream media much to, to reach the people, and I think that's the way to go. And like this is uh, where the, the the role of uh, of journalist comes in, as uh, the the previous uh, panel had talked about. On 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 on. Michael Olunga, watch Spot On every Monday, 10 p.m. on NTV. Fanda Pilos is catastrophe, one. The Papa Charles Papa. At his other June Christmas, we have to panga panga my food fight. He has invited me to come. Simuni alikego tuta kika moja ni panu mudomo watu wa nituange na chapati za pinda za pa kwa mudomo yaani aish. Iko jita hii Christmas. To get Christmas food fight by Papa Jasper, dial star 812 star 805 hash. Skiza, Nan Nation. What I'm about to do, I'm sure nobody expected. I want to give them an experience that they will never forget. 
every performer has 40 hours of rehearsal booked. With a band. Yeah. I mean, I'm worried. It's easy to come here to come at Fire Festival. Yeah, I'm not going to come here to come before Soulfest. Thank you. It's Soulfest like any day, Deji. Faster, change your life. An artist's worst nightmare, you know, it, it, it happened. We're really in the business of selling emotions, it seems. Finally, everything is sorted out. TV turning on your world. The following program has been rated PG. It may contain scenes unsuitable for children under the age of 10. Step to the right one time to the left then pause. It's feeling good, feeling proud. Hi, what's up, beautiful people? This is your girl Nadia Mokami, aka the African pop star. And you're watching Kwetu Mix, Dania NTV. Keep it locked, straight up. Stoic, and uh, everyone elsewhere was looking with, uh, you know, in wonder. I do not know whether that particular model or way of doing things is extended to other diseases, especially those that are precipitated by climate change. Thank you. Uh, talking about COVID in Tanzania, you know, we, we had a uh, hard time, but, but uh, later on we, we managed to approve that. Nowadays, I mean, our vaccination rate is, we have vaccinated almost 94% of those who are um, eligible for so vaccination. there was a fundamental shift yes there are a lot of fun fundamental shift okay. uh, uh, that have been taken so that the same as has been taken to i mean to, to other uh, diseases um not not only those are, are climate change related but all other diseases that we are talking about so we can take we can take example for uh, for example in um, in september this year we, we had an, an outbreak of leprospirosis in in a northern part of tanzania and you know, leprospirosis had not been there in Tanzania for for quite some time. So we had we had cases in in eighties, in in uh, in Arusha, but just we had uh, uh, an outbreak of of of, uh, of leprospirosis, of which um, people are getting fever, and some of, some of them have um, a coughing blood because it affects the lungs and 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 the hearts. So this had been a disease of uh, of um, of uh, no, uh, I mean South Americans. Most of, of of time from on there, so it we got outbreak in there, and um, I think the w the way we, we deal with it, you know, um, because you know, uh, let's parosis, parosis is a zoonotic disease also. It's come from rats, and and they go to the water because you know I think because of the climate change again, yeah. the rats will move to the water bodies. And uh, they leave their their urine there with with the with the leprospira uh, species, and then when you go to to, to, to fetch water and uh, and people got it, so the the we reacted very well because uh, we with with our institution again of medical research they they went and investigated, and openly so the lesson from from COVID nineteen has, has taught us that we we need to tackle uh, the emergency when they come in. At at the same time wh when when they are there and actually we we made it to control it and uh, now we we don't have uh, um, a patient with leprospira again in in that region in Tanzania. All right. Now with regard to how the solutions are rolled out, uh, generated, there is concern across the continent, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. We haven't uh, been able to find uh, studies of how governments react in. Uh, uh, Arab world, which is uh, Morocco, Tunisia, the Arab world of Africa. And within sub-Saharan Africa, uh, corruption is endemic. 
no doubt about that, something that affects the financing of the health budget. And even when funds are rolled out, more than 85% of those funds go into uh, you know, salaries, uh, logistical aspects, so much so that by the time interventions are made, the officials are again calling press conferences to say, we do not have money, it has run out. The health care systems are already weak and uh, affected by such uh, problems. How do we move from that? Of course, I know I can't fight corruption the way I want to fight it, and perhaps neither can you, but where is the trajectory that is best to be taken in fighting that particular scourge? To you, Dr. Kambugu. Yeah, I mean, that's a, <laughs> a loaded question, if I can say that. Mm. I mean, again, let me cite some examples from my own experience of encouraging signs. Um, and, and, and again, it's in line with the spirit of this meeting around thought leadership. Where are the ideas coming from? Uh. So the institute I lead actually was a response to another existential threat to sub-Saharan Africa, which is HIV and AIDS. So when this crisis hit uh, Africa, I think there were no avenues within the university, for example, to be relevant to that crisis. And so this led to a creation, and I think it was an experiment, of uh, an autonomous entity within a well-established public university. The autonomy being important for efficient, what you call operational efficiency. So I think you might know that in some government departments or in public universities, you might take a year to procure a, a vehicle because of the structure of the university. So institutes like ours were created to really be agile and nimble uh, relevant uh, institutions. But to answer your question, what I'm trying to get to is that the institute has emerged as a an organization that works alongside the Ministry of Health, works in the interest of the Ministry of Health and gives priority to the extent that re in the recent Ebola crisis, donors felt comfortable on the basis of the track record of the Institute to give us the resources for the, the response. And I think that uh, because the Institute is a local organization we are not headquartered in Washington. We are based in Kampala at Makere on the main campus. We are part of the local infrastructure. We are part of the health system. But we've developed a culture and systems where resources are put to the right purpose. So I think that should be seen as a, a positive development. And I think leading from that, the donors have also learned from our model on how to engage ministries of health and giving them grants like the ones they give us. So uh, I think that's the example that I can cite. And since we're talking about thought leadership, um, it, it would be interesting to see what other African universities are doing in terms of autonomous entities that are not the standard where the university operates, but entities that support Ministry of Health. I mean, our program, for example, has um, we have staff in the West Nile region, in Karamocha, which is like Turkana here. So it's very interesting that if you go to these regions, you'll find logos of the university and the institute because we have presence on the ground there doing work, supporting the ministry. Thank you. Okay, would you like to respond to that particular question? Yes, it was yes, a bit if loaded. If, if I could add yeah. on that, you know, talking about corruption in Africa is, you know, it is, <laughs> it is everywhere. You yeah. know, when it comes to the, to the to our uh, to health system and and so w what we have learned w because with the work that we are doing back home, no, what what we have, what we have learned how to engage the, the government, especially the ministries, our mini the minister, for example, minister of health. If you have your agenda, you have to move with it, okay. and then they will buy it. If you have an agenda, you have to, to remove it. You have to move with it, and you know because I within the ministry they have a lot of. There are a lot of policies that have been there. There are a lot of, of, of priorities that I have. So as, as uh, scientists, as, uh, as, um, as professionals, 
for example, when we are talking about, uh, just give an example of, of sickle cell disease in Tanzania, for example. So, you know, initially, in uh, just back in uh, 2006, 2007, and we are, we, are, we are telling the government that the, the prevalence of sickle cell in this country is massive. And they were telling us there's no sickle cell in this country. So we went down and do our research. So we had a research and involved other uh, scientists in the, in the country. So we, we came up with a very big evidence and a, a, a cohort of more than 400 um, uh, sickle cell patients within Dar es Salaam. And we tell them, you see, these are the data and these are the patients. So we want this thing to be registered in the national uh, NCD uh, registry of the ministry. With the evidence, they cannot refuse. And we demanded it to be budgeted for within the uh, uh, ministry of budget. And because we had evidence and we push it hard, it had been put there. And actually we have the national strategy, strategic plan for, for the sickle cell disease. And it is now funded not only with the, gov with the government, but also uh, from outside. But again, one another thing is that, you know, um, if you, I within our countries, we depend much on donors. Of course, they, 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 they have money, they have, but at, again, we also need our commitment, local, local commitment, and so that we find the also local solutions. And we, uh, you see, if you map, for example, in Kenya here, if you, you, you map uh, the companies or, or the individuals who can help, we have not done much that locally because you know the donors are there, they can they can fund us, but we can map them locally, and and put them in task that we need this to be done. Those things that, that we have a, we have a very good examples on on those back home, and I think we need, we can start with that. When the governments are not buying in, we have to start as professionals and identify the funders locally and speak with them, and we see what we can do together. So so in that case, we can help in building the the resilient health system that can help us to tackle uh, the problem that we have, but also the, the health-related climate change that, that are now coming in, in our countries. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Allow me just uh, shift attention to uh, science and technology and how that is being adopted to ensure that some of these solutions, especially the ones that resonate with the youth who are, well, arguably very much affected by climate change than any other uh, age group, when it comes to development of apps, some of them are down to distribution of medicines or even distribution of information that reaches uh, communities that the mainstream authorities uh, cannot reach. What is the direction that is being taken by actors who may not necessarily be collaborating if directly with the governments in order to ensure that technology is part and parcel of the solutions to the problems that are created by climate change. Dr. Kambugu. Yes, so I think our contribution towards climate change per se at the root cause are only beginning. But what we're doing is we're leveraging what we've learned in the infectious disease space and then seeing how they can apply to yeah. climate change. I'll give you maybe one or two crisp examples of uh, some of the work we're doing. So at the Infectious Diseases Institute at Makerere, we actually have an academy for health innovations. It's called the Academy for Health Innovations, Uganda. And it's kind of like an incubation center to really empower young people to apply their talent, and uh, including building apps. So a, a very specific app that the academy has rolled out is an app where um, a patient can access medication at a community pharmacy. Uh, this app was developed again in the context of the HIV epidemic and was a response to patients always coming back to clinics and congesting clinics. And then in the setting of COVID-19, as you know, we didn't want the clinics to be full of patients. So it, in that context, you can see how an infectious disease drove the process for us to decongest health facilities. So what happens is that instead of the patient coming to a health center or a district hospital. They go to a community pharmacy, which is a private sector pharmacy, which is also incentivized for each patient they see, and they pick up their medication. The 
the value addition of the app is around accountability for the drugs. Because then there's a clear trail, who took the medicine, when, in what quantities, and both the patient and the community pharmacy, but also the health facility gets a record of that transaction. So you can see how um, that kind of technology is helping to um, deal with the health challenge. Okay, before Dr. Osati uh, adds to that uh, submission, I would like to inform the audience that uh, we shall be accepting some questions from you. So if you have any questions for Dr. Elisha Osati and Dr. Andrew Kambugo, please uh, do prepare that question. I think uh, some of my colleagues will be moving around uh, with a microphone so that you can be able to also share your submissions. Dr. Elisha Osati, your submission on that. Yes, th thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate uh, 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 my colleague here with, with, with the, what you're saying on innovation yeah. and, and technology. So I think the COVID has, has taught us a lot of things. And you, you can remember during um, COVID-19, for example, there are a lot of mental health issues, you know, mental health issues, gender violence uh, issues, you know, things. but talking to, to um, climate change point of view, you will agree with me, if you go to Dar es Salaam, for example, today, it is so hot. Yes, the, the, the weather is, is, is hot. From, I think it's good to Mombasa also in, or in Kisumu. You know, the rays of one, just only 1 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius to 2 uh, uh, degrees Celsius of temperature will affect a lot of people, will affect almost 1 billion people worldwide. And you know the rise in 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 temperature will cause the heat stroke, for example. The heat stroke is is where you will sweat a lot and you will lose a lot. You'll have you'll be dehydrated and your body will retain salts, and that will affect your body functions. It will affect your concentration. It will affect your yeah, the ability of your brain to to function well because of you have the concentrated electrolytes. Uh, for example, sodium uh, and the like. So if you realize that, and that will also uh, have effect on the mental health, on the mental mental uh, health of a lot of people. And so if you look, uh, listen to, to, to media now or watching the, the, the social media, you'll find that there are a lot of um, mental issues of violences within the social media or within the, the mainstream media, a lot. I can just take example in Tanzania. You might find this guy have have, have killed his wife. You know, this was a, a do this to, to kids. So there are a lot of rise in mental health also, and uh, I think that is also complemented by the by the climate change. So well, in our our Australian university, we sat we sat down and and, and said, what what can we do as as um, as professionals? Uh, we know we cannot reach everybody in the community, but we can do something. So we, we come up with, the, with an app, we call it Trafiki app. Of course, I'm, 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 I'm li leading the, 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 the innovation. Yeah. So we so come up what's with- What's the name of that app? Trafiki app. A Rafiki app. Yes, yeah. so, so we come up with the, with the Rafiki app, the app that you can rate yourself on your mental status, or your family member can rate you because when you see your behaviors can read your and and then they can communicate that we there is a, a, a number that that you can phone number that you can call or if it's extreme we have the the, the mental health uh, specialist whom you can call and talk to or if it takes too extreme you can go and see her or, or, or him so we have we have a facility for that so you you can you can see talking about the the technology and innovation Actually, this is a way to go now, taking the advantage of the, the, the social media we have and, and the good networks that now we, we are having, all of even to the, to the villages. So, so those are the examples of, of a solution that we can, we can get uh, by using the technology and because it helps people. I, I know the colleagues in Uganda whom we, we have worked with concerning with, with, the, with the tuberculosis medications. So they created the app. Actually, they, they are using even the drones to, to deliver uh, 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 tuberculosis medications to, to patients in their home. 
and there is another app that that help uh, um, people who have, uh, um, for example, you have an accident, those or those who need a blood transfusion, the drones will 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 deliver um, the drones, even the ambulances will deliver the blood, but just by communicating through the app. So there are uh, there are innovations that are going uh, on around the, the the Africa and around our our East African region. So yeah, so I can say that. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much. At this uh, point, we're going to have to allow some questions from uh, the audience. Uh, my colleague there has a microphone to one of the, uh, a lady rather, there. Please uh, do ask your question. Ensure that you are very precise and pinpoint. All right, thank you. My name is Dr. Sylvia Vito. I'm in the healthcare space, specifically in the pharmaceutical sector. I just want to add on a contribution to what my senior colleagues have iterated, and this is around the neglected tropical diseases. 80% of the NTDs, neglected tropical diseases, are in con continents like Africa. Today, the direct impact of climate change, that 1.5 to 2 degrees increment in temperature, has caused the highest mutation rates of some of the vectors that we have. So diseases like dengue fever, for example, are becoming immanageable because the mutation of these vectors means they're no longer responding to the current treatment methodologies that we have. Yet at the same time, very little funding is behind neglected tropical diseases that I found were in Africa. So there is a need for a wider conversation around what climate change really means to us when things like dengue fever, leishmaniasis, filariasis become a crisis on an already constrained healthcare system. So let's think of temperature increment or drought or floods with direct impact on the vectors mutating and no longer being responsive to the current treatments that we have, therefore what we call like antimicrobial resistance, yet clinical trials are not being well funded for these same diseases. So it's a vicious cycle of poverty directly correlated to the climate change. And maybe my senior colleagues on the panel could expound on that. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there's another question, a gentleman right behind you. Please note that down so that uh, you can be able to respond a little later. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Babu Madio. I, I um, CEO of Dream Group Foundation Africa. My question relates to the African responses and solutions. And now we are talking about health. And we are talking about the Ministry of Health, which is good. But in Kenya, and actually we all know, even in Africa, WHO, WHO tells us that 80% of Africans use traditional medicine. And uh, so my, I, that keeps me thinking, if 80% of Africans are using traditional medicine, so it uh, means the ministries of health are serving 20% of the population. So which is the alternative health care system here? Yeah, Is it really the traditional medicine which is alternative or it is the, <laughs> the so-called allopath allopathic or conventional medicine? Conventional medicine. That is one. Okay. Number two, I would say that um, in Kenya, COVID, was actually a blessing in disguise. In the sense that uh, a lot of patients were treated by herbal doctors. And the government knows this. And uh, a lot of them actually uh, got cured or they recovered. Yeah, they recovered. Let's say they recovered. And they are still around. So really, I would think the, the African innovation and solution, especially in terms of health, health care, is to go back to the African traditional medicine. Yes, we can validate, we can uh, give it quality, but that's, to me, where our emphasis should be. And I know Saying this, I, there was a medicinal, uh, traditional medicine and medicinal plants uh, network program that was done between the East African countries in the 2000s. Uh, I wonder 
where we are. I knew I know Tanzania and uh, and an act to that effect. NCRL L in Uganda was dealing with it. I wonder why we are not actually moving to integration of traditional medicine into the healthcare system as actually an African solution. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for that submission. And uh, there's a gentleman on your left there. Thank you. Hello, my name is Levi Howes, uh, previous US Army officer visiting family here in Kenya. Um, my question is about emissions. You talked earlier about some of the harmful particulates that uh, invade the lungs. Uh, could you expound on the long-term implications thereof? Um, being an emissions advocate myself, I, I see some things that are happening in the U.S. in terms of reform, uh, allowing exhaust to be released above pedestrian heads and um, knowing of some biotechnology solutions that can reduce emissions. but. I, you know, continuously hearing the fact that only 3% of overall emissions come from Africa. Some may believe that emissions are not something that can be improved upon. So can you uh, shine some light on the impacts that would happen and how pervasive they are in terms of health outcomes and public health um, if those emissions were actually reduced? Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, you've been noting down those uh, questions. I don't know what, uh, Dr. Kambugu, do you want to go first? Yeah, let me let me go first. I, All right. I think my colleague will handle the um, the issue of emissions, o only to say that we we actually also have a Lang Institute at Makere, and they do a lot of air quality studies and and also to say if you've been to Kampala, you do know that some of the emissions are not just <laughs> emissions from cars, but even dust it can be a, a significant emission because of the uh, the paucity of uh, road networks that are tarmacked. But so let me address the other questions and let me preface it by saying really the philosophy of the Kusi Ideas Festival is to challenge each other. This, uh, so the panel here does not really <laughs> have all the answers. It's this is a, a workshop where we challenge each other. But having said that, um, NTDs, um, uh, le let me say my sister that the, you know, I'm based at Makere, but we have programs, for example, in the West Nile region of Uganda. And I can tell you that there's probably not a region like that anywhere in the world uh, related to NTDs. Uh, I can tell you that that place has schistosomiasis, leishmaniasis, draculosis, and other exotic sounding diseases in, in one area and adjacent to the uh, River Nile. And so actually we see our presence there. We call that region a public health laboratory. That's why we are there. We want to understand this. I believe the contribution Makere and the Institute is making in that context is first of all gathering credible data that can then inform the research agenda. Like you're saying, there are mutations. We've got some resources from among others uh, entities like the Fleming Fund from the United Kingdom to really make sure we are data centric, that our responses are informed by data. But as you said indeed, um, we do have a challenge to all of us make sure we are advocating our governments to put resources. We cannot expect that our development partners will drive this agenda for diseases that predominantly affect us. So all of us here <laughs> really have a, a role to highlight um, what the countries are investing in that space. I appreciate the uh, comment around the traditional medicine. And, and I'll tell a personal story. When, like my brother, I'm an internist, meaning adult physician. And I did my, my dissertation at the master's level on a condition, uh, meningitis. In that study, I documented the fact that 80% of my patients first go to either a traditional. So what you're saying is really true. Uh, when you see somebody walking into uh, a health system with a severe infection, it means they've been uh, shopping and this is like the last alternative. 
So really, we really need a paradigm shift in the way we think about the health system. But as they say, every cloud has a silver lining. So COVID-19 and Ebola have taught Western doctors like us and our institutions to ha you know, on how to productively engage traditional healers, f even faith healers and others. So I'll give you an example uh, using the current Ebola epidemic in Uganda. We've had one or two instances where someone under isolation escapes from the isolation unit and goes to a traditional healer and infects the traditional healer and his family. So I can tell you that these instances have made the traditional healers appreciate Western perspectives, for example, on infectious diseases. Because if you're a traditional healer and you get Ebola from your patient and you give it to your wife and your two kids and you all die, I think it really begins to challenge some of the false notions they have about uh, the principles of infectious diseases in the, in the Western mindset. So we're using these instances to engage. So for example, we are using both traditional healers and community pharmacies as surveillance points. Who's reporting with fever? Who's reporting with vomiting? So that it's inclusive the way we look at uh, this pandemic. So these are just some insights. But really, I think uh, I, I think an, uh, a festival like this, we should have maybe small working groups, so that they, you know, we bounce ideas and and come up with some concrete actionable plans. Thank you very much. Allow me emphasize something there with regard to the gentleman's uh, submission on integration of uh, traditional medicine and uh, conventional medicine. I think what he wants most is are there uh, mechanisms under which the traditional uh, healers or those that administer herbal medicine are co-opted into the modern or conventional medicine uh, regime. Is there something deliberate that is being considered by the authorities or anywhere, perhaps in Tanzania? Yes, uh, thank you thank you very much. Be these, are, these are very uh, good point of, of discussion mm. that, that we are having. I think the, the first one on neglected diseases, you, you answered it very well. And uh, I think what we, we need to do, what I said earlier is that we really need to determine what we have locally to, uh, to fund, for example, the, the NTDs, neglected tropical diseases, because we have them. Yeah, take, take for example, filariasis. When you go to, to coastal areas, you find, um, we call it mamuini, yeah, with hydrocele. And that is because of, of filariasis. So, so we have a massive, massive project for dealing with that uh, uh, back home. So, and, and those are, some of them are, are locally driven. So we, I think we, we should really invest, look what we have locally and invest and help our people. So talking about the, the tradi traditional medicine, or we call it alternative medicine uh, thing, um, if you go to Tanzania, we have a directorate of, um, within the Ministry of Health, we have a directorate of traditional medicine, but also we have the board, the board of traditional medicine, the board within the Ministry of Health, and we have the director who is responsible for that. So we, we register uh, um, herbal medicine, alternative medicines uh, in, in our country, and actually they are regulated. So if you take, for example, with, 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 uh, with COVID, I think in Tanzania we practice it that, that much, probably more than uh, any other country, probably more than East African country. And I want to tell you, in this morning when I was, when we were here, I was outside there, and I was in a, in a Zoom, Zoom call, uh, because I'm also a uh, uh, member of the National Ethical Committee, National Research Ethical Committee in Tanzania. So we were discussing the submission of, of a researcher who was, who was looking at the, the impact of traditional medicine uh, to COVID patients. So we, we had a local um, a medicines like uh, we call COVID or, you know, the BPG. So we are discussing that because they, they started from the regime of the late uh, 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 Dr. Magufuli. They started that, the, 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 the I mean, the, the clinical trial.
to, to see what's the effect of the, the local helps that we had. And it's, it's going well, and probably we, the, the result will be published. So you can see in, in, in Tanzania, we, we really cherish it because, as you said, more than 80% of our patients will go there. Uh, I think what is important is, is um, to collaborate each other. So I, I've seen, um, I was invited to one of the meetings. Formerly, I was the president of the Medical Association of Tanzania. And uh, I was invited to one of the meetings that where they, they are making the, the, uh, the curriculum for traditional medicine. We call it in integral medicine. Integral, it, it taught much more in, in Cuba. But so in, in Tanzania, we're also developing a curriculum to, uh, to train um, uh, clinic officers who can take the integral medicine. It, so it included the, the modern medicine and traditional medicine. So, so we are that, that much far, and because we, we realize that the traditional medicine has, has a part to play. Yes, so, um, okay. yes, so uh, there was a, qu uh, a comment on, on the, the parti particles. Emissions yes, particles particle emissions. Really, yeah. This is a very big problem uh, everywhere in, 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 in the world. So we, we take it as, as the pollen, take it as, as uh, gas, gas emissions. So this particulate will, will go to the lung, and actually they have very long, I mean long-term impact is very big. I want to tell you, uh, leave aside the cigarette, the number two causes of, of COPD, chronic uh, of, uh, obstructive pulmonary diseases, is the particulate that are emissions from, from the gushers, uh, from the diesels that along the roads and in the, mini, uh, I mean the, the industries. So if you take, if you follow, if you follow up the, the, the patient with, with, the, with the chronic obstructive lung diseases, and it will start very small with the dilatation of, of the bronchioles, the, the airways, we call it bronchitis. And then it, it moves slowly and your patient will start having um, um, pulmonary pressure. The pressure within the, the pulmonary vessels will increase. And then this patient will go to heart failure in, in, a, in, a, in, in, in few years. But some of them, about up to 9% of them will develop lung cancer. So, so that's, that's, that's the effect that we, we have seen so far following this patient. And uh, I told you, I'm, I'm doing a, uh, uh, my PhD in, in, in COVID and try to look at the outcome of COVID. And uh, yes, just yesterday, we analyzed the data and we found those with, with the COPD, almost 80% of them has died. Those with had severe COVID. So the effect of, of these particulates is, is very massive, is very massive. So I think the, we, we and, and actually I, I talked with, with this, um, about this uh, before, most of our, our mothers or grandparents are living in village. And in the village, they use the firewood for cooking. And from the firewood, they will get the carbon and the particles. And for example, in Tanzania, some of the, of the places, you might find that a woman with the red eyes, they say that is, is a witch, witchcraft. You know, so, so we punished by the community. But it is, it is because of the particles that, that have been using. So it, it has brought the, the social effect on that. But again, uh, with, with the, with the long-term um, uh, pulmonary disease have been there. So I think we, as, as we are discussing here, we really need to, um, to speak loud uh, to the world, to our government, to our leadership, that we, we, we really need the alternative uh, energy for cooking, even in the villages, to save our forest, but again, to save our, our, our families. Thank All you. right. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Osati, for that uh, submission. Allow me to ask whether we are up to speed with meeting the challenge of coming up with solutions early enough to be able to mitigate any more adverse effects. For example, we are seeing the incidence, for example, floods increasing, and those, uh, those floods go out to cause a lot more problems, including cholera. That speaks to interventions from government, uh, other stakeholders, but also at individual level. Dr. Kambugu, do you think uh, communities are being sensitized enough Authorities are putting in enough uh, effort in intervening to ensure that we do not get repeats of uh, uh, landslides and then the effects, what comes out of that, we begin to deal with uh, health emergencies one after the other. We should be able to take a year, even if 
some event has happened, we are able to deal with the effects. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a really short submission. I, I've been listening carefully s the whole morning, and I, I think those of us in the health sector, mm. we really just see the consequences yeah. after a lot of action has happened. And I think there are other actors downstream. I mean, you had sessions around financing and all of this. Right. Our contribution in the health sector, I believe, is to build robust health systems that can detect a, prob a problem and so that we can respond. And so uh, the example I'll give are the emergency operation centers that we are establishing to support the government to detect these problems. Okay. Um, and because some of these are decentralized, there are opportunities to engage district leadership and district committees, including uh, sensitization. Thank you. All right, Dr. Sati, your last words of this as we conclude. Uh, the